So, uh, huh. So we were supposed to go last week, but you had to cancel for migraine reasons. Understandable. So, what's the deal, man? Why are you here? So, um, I was about 4k last season, but then I dropped to 3k and I was stuck until like last week. And then I thought I, there's a reason I'm stuck. So I thought I'd get a coaching session to see why. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Probably your teammates, but, uh, yeah. So just kidding. What's your, uh, primary role here? Uh, five. Okay. Five and four. Five and four. Okay, so five slash four. What and you you said was four k. Now you're three k. Um, I've actually gained like four hundred m more in the past like few days. That's quite nice. So you're like three point four. Yeah. Okay. Now three point four k, and uh, you have replays in mind for us to watch. I'll paste it in the chat. One sec. A lot of f's. Okay. And which hero are you? Oh, you're a silencer. I see, I see. Yes, yes. Okay, Sorry. I'll go ahead and share Dota with you. Here you go, buddy. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Nice, good. Good communication thus far. So any uh, preliminary questions before we get started? Do you feel like there's things you clearly know are a problem or are you kind of just here to find that out from me well, um, i think that i understand where to keep the lane like most of the time um, okay. it was just like sometimes i just feel like we lose the game from the lanes i feel like my lane is really good so or it's not really good but you know it's better than it's what your mmr is maybe yeah i definitely know i definitely know that for a fact so i just need to like I don't know, I just want to, you to tell me what's wrong, because I'm obviously doing something wrong. Okay, gotcha. So I definitely think starting the game AFK is a bad thing. Very bad. Yeah, definitely. Uh, not, like, to be obvious, but, it, like, that first, like, minute can be pretty decisive in terms of who has ward control and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think, like, when you buy items on any roll, you need to know what they're for. So, like, at first I saw two sentries, and I was like, why the fuck does it have two sentries? But then I see Ricky, right? So, the idea for me is, if I have two sentries against Ricky, one of them's going mid, and the other one, is, like, because that also simultaneously might de-ward a mid-low ward, and the other one's going in my lane or in my pull camp, one of the two. So, my question for you is, in general, as a support, why, when would it be better to put it in lane or when it, you should put it in the pull camp? If I'm versus a, uh, if there's no invis hero in the game, and well, I'm talking about against the... Ricky. So against Ricky, it's better in the lane because then he can't stay in the lane very well because he just gets around. Or is that not right? Okay, so what does a sentry do against Ricky? It reveals him, but it like controls an area that he can't go in without being revealed, right? Yeah. So when do you put the sentry in the pull camp? against Ricky. I guess you don't, unless he's contesting the pull. What if your primary job in that lane, because you can't really fight the lane, is to pull, and he's the one continuously stopping you from pulling? So it would go beside the camp? It would go by next to the camp. So the emphasis of the sentry is that okay. it controls a specific area, and you need to think about going into the lane. What area do I need to control against this Ricky? Is it the lane, or is it the jump pull camp, right? So... Like, sometimes, as a carry, I don't really care if Ricky keeps popping out of invis, like, as long as the lane's near my tower, and, okay. and like, I can CS decently, and then, like, maybe you buy dust at, like, three minutes into the game, and then we kill the guy, you know what I mean? But, like, yeah. I, you know, I can't stand it if the guy's poking at me, and the lane's out here, and you can't pull, because there's a ward there, or, you know, whatever. So... When it comes to pulling, I've talked about this with a lot of supports. Do you know when you choose to pull or not? If the lane's in a position where my carry can't see us properly. Basically, I say to myself, 
if we have two heroes here based on where the lane is, right? Based on where the lane is, if we have two heroes against their two heroes, is that good? If the answer is no, you pull, right? So, like, if the lane's right next to your tower and you can't fight them anyway, might as well just pull. If the lane's out here and you can fight them, why pull, right? Like, just because the lane's here doesn't mean you pull, right? So the only reason the lane position matters is because it changes, like, certain dynamics of the lane, meaning, like, certain lanes you're perfectly happy if it's right here, but you're not happy at all if it's right here, right? So in that case, if you care about lane equilibrium, you'll know when the lane goes out here, I'm going to pull. So generally speaking, going into a lane as a support, I think to myself, when's it good for us? And, like, when should I pull, if ever? Because there's some lanes where you just never pull. Like, it's bad to pull, because if it's 2v2, you win, but your carry loses 2v1, then you should not pull, right? Because you're actually making it worse for your carry by pulling. So these are all just things to think about. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this right now, why do you think I'm talking about this so long? About the position of the ward, because... You just placed two sentries to try to kill the guy for first blood. Does that yeah. fucking matter, right? Like No, like, as soon as I placed the second sentry, it was just like, why did I do that? But so bad. you should buy these items, and the reason why being AFK, or, like, being AFK mentally, that I talk to all these 4K players about, all these, like, even 6K players, is think about why you bought the damn sentries, right? Like, what am I using these for? Where are they going, you know? So it's like... If you're always a four or five position player, you can really get this like mental muscle memory going where it's like, do I need sentries? Like a lot of games, I don't even buy sentries. I learned like watching um, like Puppy and uh, Fly that they don't really buy sentries at the start of the game. In this game, you have a Ricky, so it's a little bit different, but like they usually buy a sentry either with the bounty rune gold or like later, depending on the game. So it's like if you have a clear cut reason to buy one, then suddenly you know when to buy it and you know what you're doing with it, right? So it's like now you just don't have a sentry for the lane. That shouldn't even be a yeah. consideration for you. But what happens is you don't think about it before this situation happens. And then when the ha situation happens, you see a Ricky barely escaping with like 200 health and you like, you know, panic react and put a sentry down. So the way you prevent yourself from doing that kind of stuff is by continuously reminding yourself of what your job in the game is, okay. why you bought a specific item. You know what I'm saying? So... It's yeah. like such a basic lesson in this part of the game, but it's something that actually applies for the entire game. It's just like as the game goes on, the decision becomes more and more complicated, even at the support role where like the warding positions and all that kind of stuff becomes even more um, complicated. So I only went into a lot of depth because this is a mistake that can be prevented from like ever happening. So, okay. So it's an awkward spot, but let's see how it plays out. You have can three I ask here. a question? Yeah, go ahead. Is there any way to make the quality of this screen share any better? Uh, no. With some people, it's bad. Where do you live? Um, UK. Yeah, okay. That kind of makes sense. Um, I've had it be bad occasionally with people from other regions. So my I stream's on, like, five-second delay. If you want to just watch the stream, okay, um, if I have to I stop. So what you can do, actually, is you can mute me on here and, like, on the call. Um, okay. And then just listen on the stream itself so you can actually see what I'm seeing live. And if you have okay, a question, then. just chime in. And it'll be a little bit awkward in the sense that, like, I won't, like, you'll do it when I'm probably talking because we're on, like, a little bit of a delay okay. here. But don't feel bad to just chime in if you have if you have a question. So. That's okay. Cool. Yeah, one sec. So, yeah, just let me know when you're good to go. Okay, I think I'm good to go. Cool. Okay. So yeah, let's go ahead and let's get it going. So we have Alchemist Crystal Maiden against what looks like... Is there a lot of solo offlanes in your bracket? I know it's going to be a delayed answer, but that's okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so... It's just like, nobody knows what to do. Like, okay. So this game, I got the Crystal Maiden, and then they just couldn't... I don't know, we just picked CM. So the way I look at this is, what are your two options in this stage in the game? And I'm just going to answer because, you know, to prevent time. Your options are to either pull immediately or to help bottom lane. 
or even walk mid. Like, just do something in some other lane. I feel like a lot of supports feel very glued to whatever lane they start the game in. So, and I want it to just be a consideration for you. Like, if you see that you're doing nothing top, and since you have no sentry, there's really nothing you can do top to this Ricky, why not just TP bottom and help your Mars fight against the two supports on their team? I mean, at that point, you have a 2v1 safe lane that's probably going to win really hard. At least, like, the Alchemist should get pretty much free farm. And then you have... You're at least helping your Mars maybe not get crippled. So it's one of those things where I would have probably, at, like, 45 seconds in, seen what happened here, felt useless, and then TP'd bottom. So, like... I think that's what ends up happening, actually. Okay. But I just feel useless in the lane, and then... I don't know. I will, I will see, but I can't quite remember what happens in this game. I think I just pill a lot. Okay. So, like, for me, what I'm looking at is if you're not feeling useful, you should just go somewhere else. Like, whether that's in the lane you go pull, whether that's in, like, uh, in this situation where now they've rotated top, and I feel like you've got a 2v2 top. And so I would just go bottom here because this top lane's kind of just... It's, it's taking you a little too long to realize you're just kind of useless here. Like, you have an alchemist. He's not really helpable, but he actually has decent farm. And you don't do anything here. So just go bottom. Like, you should have gone bottom at 45 seconds. It's still not too late to go bottom at three minutes. Like, still I not think, too late. Go ahead. I don't think I go bottom in this game. Okay. I don't think I do at all. And that's why it's really tough to talk about games like this any further. Like, we'll learn a little bit past the laning stage. But in this laning stage, it's really important to immediately recognize you're useless. And sometimes, when I say useless, okay, the way I deem useless, what does the lane look like if you're there? What does the lane look like if you're not there? And so there's lanes okay. where I deem a support useless, like my last game, where I'm winning the lane, and them being there doesn't make me win the lane anymore. So, like, I tell them they're useless, because, like, get out of my XP range. Like, fuck off. I don't want you here. Because, like, if I don't need you, even if you, like, aren't quote-unquote useless, I define useless as the fact that my lane is the same whether or not they're there. So, in this situation, you should always be asking yourself as support. It's, like, honestly the number one question in, like, the first five minutes of the game. Am I changing this lane? So, if you aren't changing the lane, give me, an idea, like, your two options. It's literally a decision tree. A lot of Dota is just decision trees. So, like, what are my two options if I don't affect the lane? Oh, um leave or just like leech xp i don't know leave or, or just two pull. options that you would decide oh yeah okay do exactly what you're doing right so like it's either just leave or pull and which one should be first going through your mind um if there's anything else you can do exactly right so like when i talk to carries okay when i talk to carries and i talked it sounds like you joined me in the call sorry so it looks like if, if i'm talking to carries and I tell them, you know, when do you jungle? Have you heard me talk about this before? Uh, yes. Okay, so when do carries jungle? Probably when there's nothing to do on the map. Yeah. On the lanes. So the way they come to the conclusion of jungling is to think about everything they could possibly do on the map. All three lanes. And then decide based on the fact that they've looked at all three lanes that there's no lane they can occupy, farm, pressure, gank, anything like that, and then where do they jungle? Nearest the place that, say there's like a tower that needs defended, or where the fights are going to happen. Depends yeah. Depends on the time of the game. Based on what their role in the game is, say they're the tower pressure, maybe they're the split pusher, what if they're the tower defender? You know, based on that role, they farm the lane near where they would go, right? So like, if they think their job is to defend the tier 1, they should be jungling around here like defend the tier one safe lane if they think it's their job to immediately create split push pressure when the other team groups up they should be farming down here right so it's yeah. like as a support the same decision goes in the laning stage what i've realized is when i have nothing better to do in my own lane or in another lane like it's the same concept then i pull right so the problem I have with this pull is I think you could have been useful bottom. I don't think Slark's very strong. I feel like Pudge Witch Doctor are kind of heroes that fuck one hero up. Like, if your Mars is trying to walk up, he's going to have a real tough time against those types of supports. 
And if you, like, help them out a little bit, that lane's going to struggle a lot more for them. So, like, it, by pulling, you have said to me and everyone else that there's nothing better you could be doing on the map. And so, for me, sometimes I need to pull for my teammate. So, like, by all means, if you think you can be bottom and the lane top is out here, and this guy needs the lane back here, like, or back here, please pull, you know, like, don't just leave, because I said, like, if that lane needs you, pulling is a way that the lane needs you, right? Yeah. So, but this type of pulling, I know you're doing it, you've already said it, but I also would have known by just watching, you're doing it because nothing, you like, you just don't know what else to do. And it's yeah, the equivalent like, of second. jungling as a carry at like 11 minutes into the game. This is like this, it's the equivalent because they're, you know, 99% of my coaching sessions, I asked the guy why he's jungling. He's like, I don't know. Didn't know what else to do. And I was like, well, shit. Okay. Like I, after, you know, two years of coaching and having that be the answer, like almost every time I was like, okay, I understand why people jungle now, <laughs> you know? So, um, in this spot, it's like a pretty big deal that you didn't TB bottom, but we're going to go and play it out. Yeah. And if you really think about it, it's like it's not that hard to be like, am I useless? You know, like, but if you're not asking yourself the right questions, suddenly it does become very complicated. So like, it's not a, it's one of these concepts that I feel like is really simple if you think about it the right way, but is like almost impossible to ever do right if you don't think about it the right way. So now we're kind of just rinse and repeating this like whole process of like, man, this is just a weird situation. You like walk over and pull instead. Or sorry, walk over and like hit the neutral camp instead. It's like this whole time they just have a Slark that's like 24 and 7. You TP to react to yeah. the guy diving. This is okay. This is all good. Like I think that was fine. Um, I just think that you could have done it from bottom. But that's not. there's nothing else to really say. So right now, I ask myself as a silencer. I ask myself as a support. Am I a ganker? Am I a counter ganker? Am I useless? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what do I do? You know, like, what do I do to this game? So, like, one of the, my biggest pet peeves is supports, like, past five minutes, you know, all the way until, like, 11 or 12, is, like, I can't fucking stand when I'm trying to pressure bottom tower, and my level three Earthshaker at nine minutes is, like, trying to fissure the guy. And I'm like, dude... Why aren't you just underneath a tower soaking XP while our tower mid is dying, right? Like, you're a level yeah. 3 fucking Earthshaker. What are you doing? Like, why are you here? You're useless. Get out of here. Like, I'm doing what I'm doing in order for you to not be useless. Like, to go get levels and a bit of farm so you're not fucking useless. So the reason why it's important to recognize, like, you know, what is my role in the game is you identify yourself as useless if you think about all your potential roles and you're just like, I can't do any of that. So it's like, do I protect my alchemist? Do I protect my invoker? Do I help Mars lane better? If the answer to all those is nothing, then at that point, you have two options. You're either going to be pulling or you're going to take farm. Like at this point, I think alchemist could just jungle, right? Okay. Like he's just what? I don't, I don't know. Like what? I said, I, I don't know if you've. I don't know if he's able to or not, I guess. Okay, so something that comes down to playing supports is if you want to, if you're taking Dota very seriously, or like at least trying to improve, is you, over time, you need to slowly but surely log your understanding of how core play, of core heroes work, okay? So like every patch, learn two or three of them, okay? So what I mean by that is, what heroes do I think you should learn every patch? The ones that are strongest and the, the strongest, patch. why? Because then if you're playing with them, you know how to play with them. Then it's You're going to be, be playing with them the most, which means that it'll have the most impact on your games. But okay. also, why? What's the benefit of the fact that there are most of them in your, in your games? Like they're the most played heroes. There's a ton of fucking well, study material. Like you can just, okay, yeah. you can literally turn on any pro game and you'll find them like 30%, 40% of the time, right? Like you'll just see that hero. Yeah. So like you need to understand how alchemist works so like at level four or five alchemist whatever lane he's in unless like the enemy is just giving him free farm like jungles that's all he does because he's useless and he wants to just hit some neutrals because he's like the one hero in the game that gets more gold from hitting neutrals than he does from hitting lane creeps right so most yep. alchemists are mid so if he's gonna do that and say he's mid so let's just approach this from the mid lane but it applies the same in the top lane if he's gonna do that from mid lane what's the opponent team gonna do if they're any good. Try and stop them. Okay. So they're going to invade or... his jungle a bunch, right? Yeah. 
And if you watch pro matches with an Alchemist mid, where do you think 90% of fights go on? If he's on Dire? Say he's Radiant mid. Probably the safe lane jungle. They, it's or all here. Like... It's all here. Like okay. this area right here. Like it's all around where the Alchemist is. Why? Because if you let the Alchemist hit for, creeps for free, what happens? He does six over. You just lose. So the other team has to stop him. So in Pro Dota, teams like OG, who just love picking Alchemist, people know how to play against Alchemist. So they spend their entire time invading. Like, uh, and then like the team with Alchemist, who knows how to play Alchemist, knows the opponent team's going to do that. And they spend the entire fucking game, like all four wards, if you watch OG, will be like, if they're dire, say, and they have an Alchemist mid, it'll be like, here, here. Like, here and here, just, like, protecting the Alchemist. Like, from, and, like, they know every time they go on Alk, they have to, like, respond if the opponent's committing a lot of resources. So the point is, if you don't understand your cores, you're not going to know what to do, it, like, when I ask you these questions. So, like, I'm not expecting you to know every core. I'm expecting you to, like, take one at a time and feel like, okay, I now get what these supports are doing. And I think at the most simple level understand how these cores play immediately after their laning stage. When does their laning stage end and what do they do with it? Okay. So I'm just giving you a couple examples to give you, um, things to consider. Okay. So these are things to consider. Like how survivable is that hero in the lane? So the more survivable they are in the lane, generally speaking, the longer they will want to lane. What does their ultimate do for them? Does the ultimate make them more survivable? Does it give them kill potential? Does it make them jungle faster? Does it make them take towers? And then you'll, like, if you think about that, it'll be it'll become very clear what your role is to that guy. Like, if it's a guy that takes towers and your hero's a support, doesn't help that at all, then you're not playing with that guy. Guess what? You know, like, you're not playing with that guy. Um, Like, a quick pop quiz. If a Slark is level 6, at 6 minutes, it's your Slark. How much help does he want from you? Very little. Very little. Yes. He's a very yep. independent hero that's level heavy and survivable. So when would you ever help Slark? If he's in danger. If they're like committing a ton of resources and you think there's an ability to play make there. So you're not going to help the Slark by sitting there and trying to make plays. You're going to help him if the opponent forces you into a situation to help him. But if you have like a safe lane jug with Omni Slash... How like how yeah, does that affect you? You should go there like to, proactively, yeah. right? Like you should do that. You shouldn't have to be told to go to your jug, right? Like, yeah, sometimes at the pro level, even it's nice for the core to communicate, like, hey, I'm strong, like we can push this tower or whatever. But like as a slark, I don't want my supports just randomly fucking showing up to my lane. That's like zero percent of games. The only time I want my supports there is when they brought like two or three heroes there, and I know we can just shit on those two or three heroes, right? Like if we bring two or three heroes. So the point is, though, is your job at this stage in the game, it really comes down to asking, you know, so what does an invoker generally want to do past the laning stage? What are his, like, two options? Probably wants to uh, go kill Slark in the bottom lane. And just he's an invoker. He doesn't gank. Invoker doesn't leave mid. Like, that hero literally... If he's Quas Wex, sure. Okay. Well, I don't know what he's... Yeah. So, well, sorry. yeah, you're right. He wants to... He wants to um... Exhort Invoker is kind of like Dusa, I feel like. He just sits around mid farming neutrals in lane, okay? So, yeah. if that's in regards to you, what do you need to consider about Invoker's lane? If Invoker's really far ahead, what's he going to do? He's going to take the tower. He's going to pressure the tower. So, if you're yeah. going mid, why would you go mid? If, like, two or three, if three of us are going mid and we're going to commit to taking the tower yeah if you want to like commit to taking the tower maybe gank for him maybe protect him while he's taking it you know and then yep. if he's behind what's he gonna do he's gonna like play safe for our in mid okay just so when should you go mid when he's strong well he's okay weak. so if he's behind he's gonna be farming jungle occasionally defending tower right yeah so when do you help him when he's in danger? When he needs help defending the tower, right? Okay. So if you're thinking about mid and you're... If you look... So at five minutes or six minutes into the game, I do this, like, status update for myself as a support. I'm like, who's winning mid? You know, who's winning bottom? Like, who has a free farm? Like, you know, who on my team has a rough one? 
as a support, if my hero on my team has a really rough start, what's my two choices in regards to that hero? As in, they're, they're for the rest of the game, or...? They had a rough start, so how do I immediately address the fact that they have a rough start? What are my two well, options? Like, can they get back into the game, or is it... It's li okay, so back, when I have a hero with a rough start, yeah, question. no, these are sometimes tough questions. So when I when my hero has a tough start, I have to help them, right? So I help yeah, them directly them, or indirectly. What does indirect help probably, look like? Like probably making space for them. Like, yeah, making space. Them towards Literally, the, the definition of making space. Making space. Like if your alchemist is getting pressured top, is alchemist a hero you help directly or indirectly? Probably indirectly. Why? Because. If well, he wants to start play alone and get the jungle coops right to farm faster. So and if you no try to help him, what happens from his perspective? Well, isn't he just a be... useless fucking piece of shit in fights when he's level four? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how, with that in mind, how should you determine if it's directly helping him or not? If you should help him directly. Sorry. Yeah, kills if, you, if he's, like, strong enough to actually help you. Like, okay. if you're a support, your strength is, like, 99% of the time dictated by how strong the guy you're playing with is. So, if you have a gyro that doesn't have the strongest start, but they're, like, diving him and he's got level 6, should you help him directly or indirectly? Yeah. You should help him directly because he has fucking call down and rocket barrage and, like, the ability to turn fights, right? So it's like... But an alchemist, if you go to his lane and try to help him, he's just going to acid spray and walk away. Because that's what a zero does. And you're just going to die. Because how much does alchemist help you, right? He doesn't help you at all. So my point is, like, I look at my heroes and I say, who's having a good start? Who's having a bad start? What can I do about it? Do I enable the guy who has a good start? Do I help protect the guy that has a bad start? Do I make space elsewhere to help the guy that has a bad start? So I'm just giving you a bunch of things to think about. And what happens is once you get in the habit of thinking these things, you'll notice what you're supposed to do late or you'll like walk out of position because you're so busy thinking about these things and then you'll just lose track and feed or some shit. Um, but the goal is eventually that you'll be able to process the information quicker. The reason why Dota is Dota is just a race. It's literally what team can process what to do correctly faster. Like, that, that's really all it is. When you watch Tier 1 players to Tier 2 teams, or Tier 1 teams to Tier 2 teams, it just looks like the Tier 1 team is a step ahead of them. That's all it looks like. They're, and it's not because the Tier 2 team is bad. The Tier 1 team just comes to the same conclusions twice as fast. So what takes a Tier 2 player five seconds, a Tier 1 player can do in two seconds. And when you do that over the course of 100 decisions in a game, you know, suddenly they're minutes behind, right? Like, they're just... And then they're th th 5K gold farm ahead, or, you know, whatever. So... At this stage in the game, there's so much information for you to process, and the only thing you can start doing, it's just like running and trying to get in shape, is to start thinking about it and slowly but surely catching yourself and getting better at it. So I'm giving you like a ton of factors. This is what this is why afterwards you just watch the replay of the session back and you just like you know, at five minutes into the game, you like have a little bullet point list for yourself of things to consider. Maybe you start with like two or three. You know, who's ahead, who's behind, who can I help? That'd be like a great yeah. three questions to ask yourself and then go from there. And it's like, there's a bunch of different ways you can help them. But if you at least come up with who you think you need to help, that's a great start. And if you don't need to help anybody, what do you get to do as a five position? I just pull. You just can go do whatever you want. Whatever you, yeah. you know, gives you some farm. You can go soak some XP under a tower. You can go pull. So if I told you to go mid because this invoker's behind and he needs help defending his tower, the next question, like the advanced version of that, would be if he's not defending the tower, it's actually your job to defend the tower and die for him, basically. Because the opponent's going to invade here before they invade here. That's just like what's going to happen. Like taking the mid tower, it allows them to take over this and this. Taking top tower allows them to take over this. But usually they're going to invade the tower before they invade this. So like, if your job is to let the invoker farm and he doesn't really want to defend the tower, it's your job to like walk under the tower and feed. And that's why there's like times where in, if you watch Pro Dota, 
There's a lot of five position players between five and 10 minutes that are just underneath a really dangerous tower feeding. And there's a reason why they're underneath that dangerous tower feeding. Cause if it's not them, it's someone else or they lose the tower, right? Like, like, so might as well be your five position, right? Like soaking some levels and feeding, like, why not? Um, if someone's going to do it you don't want your carry. Um, so it applies to all three lanes though. It's just like, if the guy doesn't want to defend, it's your job to go sit there and die. And like, you'll learn to do it better. Meaning you'll learn to maybe make them commit three heroes instead of one or two to kill you based on your like positioning and stuff. Um, long talks thing is supports kind of mainly conceptual. So that's, that's kind of what ends up happening here. So you end up smoking. I personally hate this play, but let's see what, let's see what happens here. Might work out. I think that was like best case scenario. I feel like if the enemy team like reacted yeah, that, at all, then I don't think that should have worked. Yeah, that but the crystal. I didn't. Yeah, it shouldn't have worked. I don't think because there's no. I feel like your invoker dies with one reaction, and if your invoker dies, the viper doesn't die, and then they all kill you. <laughs> That's what I feel like happens. Um, so this is one of those things where another example of yeah, this works. But I would have given my alchemist like a ward, and then like probably never come back here again unless they're unless you think you can save him. So now the only reason I'm fine with you being here is because alchemist should not be here anymore. So you should just say like, "Hey, alchemist, like top lane sucks. I can't protect you. Go jungle." Like that's what I would say if okay. I was support. If the guy doesn't listen to you, like okay, you know, uh, so be it. You can't do anything about that. But this alchemist should literally never come back here. Like I don't know what he's doing. Like, in terms of, like, that just makes no sense. This There's all all the enemy's plays are going to be here. They have an independent hero, Slark. So they're not going to help him at all. So I'm giving you all the reasons why I know they're going to play here. Because Alchemist is pressurable. Slark doesn't need help. I mean, he fed, whatever. But uh, Slark doesn't need help. And the Alchemist should just be jungling while you're doing exactly what he's doing here. So you place the ward. So the problem was, when you left top, you waited until 8 minutes to try to establish ward control. And guess what? wards are a race as well if they have wards there first you're like never getting wards there it's really hard to get wards there because yeah. even if you end up dewarding them and warding they know you did that because you did that right like, like they know you went there and dewarded so then like unless you actually protect the ward you're not actually going to keep that ward it's just going to be until you guys leave the area um, but if you just place it ahead of time then you can just have a ward for alchemists that they don't know is there so all these plays are really strange to me because, not from you, but your team in general, is your entire team is fighting around this alchemist, like, proactively. Meaning, like, they're diving a tower in alchemist's lane. Which is, like, makes no sense, right? Like, because alchemist doesn't apply tower pressure, alchemist doesn't help. So, in these types of spots, it's kind of on you as a five to stop going here. Because by being here, you're enabling the rest of your team to go here. So, like, what I mean is, like, if your Crystal Maiden doesn't know what to do and she sees two heroes top on your team, she's gonna be like, oh, I guess I go there. Yeah. You know? It's like, at the most basic level, you know, these guys are 3.5k or whatever. What the fuck? I haven't seen a single play made around Mars. And he's, like, a team fighting initiator. Yeah. And there's been five plays made around Alchemist, right? So it's like, what? And so... I look at, I go, I load into this game and I as a support, what makes kills or plays happen? What two things combined? What does it take to kill someone? Like a stun and then damage? Yeah, stun and damage. So like, if I'm a support, I'm like, which one of those do I do? And which one of those does the other guy on my team do? Like, like who helps me, Right. And so it's like, in this game, you're not really a disable, right? Like, you're just a slow and some no. utility. So you need somebody that has some catch, like somebody that can disable them for you. And this is so... why, like, this whole replay is just fucked. Because I first picked the silencer, and then he picked the Crystal Maiden, and I was like, why would you... Well, Crystal Maiden's like, this? it's not a terrible support duo if you have, like, a couple do shit cores. The point is... If that is if that's in mind with what you're saying, how often should you really be making plays with Crystal Maiden? Probably. So I guess if I say stuns and damage add up, do you and Crystal Maiden offer enough of either of those? I think Crystal Maiden is enough. And but I don't what I'm saying is 
is if you consider her, does she change your status? Meaning if it's you plus her, are you now content going for a kill? Yeah. With just you two, you are content going for a kill. Okay. No. So if they're in a game where it's like Rubik chin, like a very common professional support duo, at least in the past, those are two supports that just those two supports are enough to set up a kill. So where do they make plays? Where do that where does that support duo make plays? Yeah. Around someone Wherever the fuck. Yeah. Wherever. Wherever those two heroes want to go, right? Because they set up the plays. But when I tell you that you and Crystal Maiden is not enough to get a kill, what does that mean? You need to make a, probably... you make plays around the people that make it enough. Does Alchemist yeah. make it enough? Yeah. No. 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 So you you plus Crystal Maiden can make plays, but it has to be to the guys that complete the equation here, right? Yeah. So like Which I didn't like to play good. mid on Invoker yeah. just because like Viper's not really a hero you want to do that against unless he's like playing overly aggressive, right? Like that guy wasn't like out of position or anything. And you just have this Mars hero that I haven't seen a single player go to a single time, right? So it's like for me, if I'm in the mid game at five minutes. I'm thinking, Alchemist is kind of just a papega, can't really do anything for me. I'm going to ward up here before I leave, such that he's protected. So, I, you know, a ward does more than me. That's what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. Like, I'd probably place a sentry on it too, just so he can see Ricky. But then, Invoker's against Viper, so maybe we can look to count. Like, if nothing happens mid lane, are you okay with that? Yeah. If Invoker and Viper are just trading farm, is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. So if that's the situation, when should you go mid? To counterplay, right? When they're making something happen. Because if you're content with nothing happening, what do you think the other team's situation is? They're if they're con if we're content with nothing happening. Yeah. They're also content. They're no? usually not content with nothing happening. Like the amount of times where both teams are content with nothing happening is very small percentage. So most of the time, if we're not looking to take an objective, what's the opponent team trying to do? Take an objective. Take an objective. So when we're talking about these decision trees as support, I look at my team and go, what objectives can we take? If the answer is nothing, what do I immediately ask myself? What else I can do? No, what is the other team going to take? Okay. Right? Like... Meaning, if you're not taking an objective, somebody is. like, And so, if you are content with nothing going on in the game, and you ask yourself, what objective will the enemy team go for, and you ward there, and you're in 3k, and the opponent never goes there, then what? Then... You're just winning. Yeah. Right? Because... Because they're nothing. Because the they're not doing anything. So I'm telling you, like, if you're content with nothing happening, all you have to be prepared for is the opponent doing something. Like that's all you have to be prepared for, right? Like you have to think, I'm going to continue doing nothing, while preparing for the opponent to do something, right? Like that's that's how I think about it. If we're the team that has to do something, then like, where do we go? Like, what hero yeah. on my team does something? You know, where you know, and then in that case. The point that I'd like to see is I'd like to see players understand that 90% of counterplays are up here and 90% of plays are down here. And or I'd say, I'd say 80% of proactive plays are down here. Another 15% Oh, you can't Sorry. see it. You can't see it. You can't see it on my I can't see your cursor. I don't think. No. Oh, what? I see it on Oh, that's weird. That's so strange. Yeah, you... I literally looked at my stream to... and saw Huh. You have to like click on the actual area on the map and then that's so weird because i you can't see it see now cursor you see it now yes okay that was it's so strange i looked at my stream and didn't see it either that was really weird okay so 80 percent of proactive plays are here or like the opponent's safe lane the other 15 percent are like right here and like the remaining five percent's up here okay like when i say proactive i mean you're the one choosing to make something happen okay and it's the opposite when it comes to counter plays 5% of counterplays are down here, 15% of counterplays are here, and 80% of them are here. It's like, that's just how Dota works. So it's like, if you ask yourself, am I on counterplay or playmaking situation, that immediately tells you where you need to ward. 
Like, if I'm in counterplay situation, I'm warding up here. If I'm in playmaking position, I'm warding down here. Like, it's, it's really... That's, like... That'll cover most of your games. Meaning, like, yeah, there are exceptions. Okay? There, are, like, are times where that does not apply. Okay? But... What happens is you'll be like, oh, we want to make plays and you make a play around bottom and you're like, and something happens and you go, oh, maybe it would have been better to do that somewhere else or whatever. And that's how you learn the exceptions. But there's really no better way to like learn those exceptions than just doing what the normal is every time and then realizing when it wasn't correct. So like in this game, I'm thinking to myself... We need to help this alchemist indirectly. Mars is a hero that offers a lot of stun and, yes, and so, like, damage. Opens. So we should be all on the bottom half of the map. That's all we should be doing. And we should have warded top because we need to prepare for the counterplay. If you're like an oracle with level six, where would you want to play? Behind wherever you think they're going to make a play. Okay. Right? Yeah. So if you're, the, if you're oracle and you're level six... And it's your team to take. If it's your team's job to take objectives, where are you playing? Hopefully, the team would be somewhere where we're gonna hedge, and then I would be waiting behind them. Who are you sitting behind on your team? The guy that takes objectives. If your yeah. team, if the enemy team's the one taking objectives, and you're an oracle with level six, who are you sitting behind? The person they're most likely to go on. Yeah, the guy defending the tower they're most likely to go on, right? Like, it, it seems so simple when you just think about it like that. Like, who's on? Who's the one taking objectives? What does my hero have to do with objective taking? Meaning, is my hero a counter player or a, a playmaker? And, like, certain heroes can vary. Meaning, like, there's certain heroes in the game that can be playmakers based on the situation. But in other situations, they can't be playmakers because... Like, Ursa can be a playmaker, but if Ursa's team has no stuns, Ursa's not a playmaker, because he needs a stun to help him make plays, right? Like, that's just an example. Yeah. Um, so Silencer, for the most part, is kind of like a chill, not playmaking hero. So I kind of think of myself as a Silencer as, like, I'm just going to help somebody do whatever they're doing a little bit better. Like, if they're a playmaker, I'll help them a little bit just by giving them some damage. If they're a counter player, I'll help them do that a little bit better, too. So the last thing you want to do is play around the guy that doesn't want you to play around him, which is the Alchemist. So the way I think about this is, I said the Alchemist shouldn't have come back top. Okay. But if he keeps going back top, then leave. Like, if I know I'm not supposed to play around Alchemist, when should I ever go to Alchemist lane? If, um, if he fucking if leaves. Like diving... Okay. <laughs> if he leaves. <laughs> like, like, that's when I go to Alchemist lane, because I know I'm not supposed to play around him, right? Wait till he leaves. So if he never leaves top and that guy insists on like either being in the dangerous part of the map or just continuously dying, like you can't do anything for that guy. Like honestly, you can't do anything to help him. So if he continues to go top without you there, he's just going to keep dying and there's nothing you can do about it. If you tell him to maybe not go back, it might help. But like at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do about it. If you give him wards and you set him up to be the best, you know, version of that you can and he just continues feeding anyway, that's the reality of supporting. You're just like, what the fuck's going on in this game? Like, I don't know. Like, why does this guy keep walking back to the lane that he shouldn't be going to? But I think the worst thing you can do is try to make plays around that guy because then suddenly you have three people doing random shit that shouldn't be happening. Um, so, like, at least, you know, that's, that's a lot. A lot of discussion in this game. But, uh, like, this should never work. I have to believe it should never work. But apparently it is. Very strange. That's kind of more how I would envision anything that happens top. Stop it! We're here again! We haven't learned! Nope. Round seven. We're top. Your Crystal Maiden smoked top! Fucking Slark is like 300 HP! Your Invoker's dying! Why is this happening? Because you and Crystal Maiden are top! Right? Like, stop yeah. it! You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just funny because you can literally ask yourself, who needs plays? Who on my team needs plays? And we've seen it time and time again here. If you go to the place... Okay, so if you don't play around the guy that's supposed to make plays, he's either going to be useless or feed. One of the two. 
if you go to the guy that isn't supposed to make plays, you're going to bring them all to you. Like, that's all you're going to do. Like, you're either going to allow them to gank the guy that is strong, or you're going to bring them to the guy that's weak. That's like the two things that are you're doing, right? Like, so if you're three top incorrectly, like here, the two things that are going to happen is your other cores are going to feed or all three of you are going to feed. That's like, yeah, right? Because if they confront you 3v3, they're going to crush you, right? Because you're playing around the core that sucks, like the one that doesn't help you. And the guy that could be making plays is not making any plays because he's alone. And that's just what's happening here time and time again. Slark, does he like being in 1v1s or 3v3s? Probably 1v1s. Okay, so why are we giving him that? Um, because I didn't think about it. These are simple questions, right? Does Alchemist want yeah. 3v3s? No, let's not bring 3v3s no. to my Alk, right? Like, there's there's heroes in the game that want heroes around them, right? Like, if you really think about it, there's a lot of heroes that do, and there's a lot of heroes that don't. And as a support, it simply comes down to understanding in each particular situation in each game what those heroes' status on that subject is. And notice how everything just goes to shit in this game, because you guys have literally been playing top nonstop. And everyone's just dying up here. Like it, it I, I told you this would have happened at six minutes, right? Like, I said we shouldn't be top. And now the guy that should be me having plays made around him is getting four man ganked and feeding, right? Like, it, it's all the same thing. And at the end of the day, this is actually the two supports. Like, let's be honest. Alchemist, yeah. yeah. Maybe he shouldn't be in lane, but he should be on the defensive part of the map. Why? Why is he on, like, the defensive part of the map? Because he can defend the tower Because he doesn't well. do anything. <laughs> okay. Right? Like, meaning he's not going to go push a tower. No. So he doesn't do anything. Why would he ever be on the aggressive part of the map? So when it's Alchemist, he knows he's going to be on the defensive part of the map. Now his choice is to be, like, anywhere here or here, right? Like, that's his choice, right? As the Mars, he's the playmaker, so he's going to be down here. Invoker is just a hero that sits mid and farms. He's going to be here. Like, that's going to happen. Like, even in 3K, yeah, sometimes in crazy games, they'll do some weird shit. And, like, usually, the definition of what happens poorly by these cores is that the Invoker is supposed to be defending mid, and he's jungling while, like, near mid while he should be defending the tower. Or your Alchemist yep. should be playing around top, but instead of jungling, he's, like, feeding in the lane. They're usually some semblance of doing the right thing they're just like doing it poorly right so for you as supports usually even in 3k what your cores are doing is pretty predictable meaning like where they're playing like where they are on the map is yeah, like of course pretty predictable how they do it and like randomly feed and stuff is like not predictable <laughs> you know there's there's no way you can predict what players are going to do even in my bracket so the summary of this first 15 minutes is just playing around the wrong guy, and we're just seeing it turn into a disaster over and over again. Like, on the, you know, Mars dying bottom, you guys dying top, Invoker, like, dying mid too. Like, there's just, everyone's dying. So, let's watch another game, because I've given a lot of examples from this game, and I think okay. we've seen the same problem over and over. And once I see the same problem over and over, I'm like, this game is so unrecognizable if you fix this one thing right so we don't want to keep going through a game that's now in a situation where you made the same avoidable mistake five times in a row i feel like it's not reasonable to expect anybody at no any level to not make the mistake you made once okay so like when you go to a situation in a game and you like go to that alchemist lane and you guys bring three heroes here and you're like this sucks and you die just don't do it again <laughs> like don't bring three heroes to the lane that's like that sucked <laughs> you know what i mean so like i think what i'm telling you is it's going to be completely realistic for you to be like i think i should be here and then that feeling sucks and i think the best what happened to my dota i guess i accidentally loaded a game and the the reaction you should have to that situation is let's not literally do the definition of insanity which is believing the same thing will result in different results doing yeah. the same thing over and over right like that's exactly what you just did so that's what we need to avoid. The, the The first step is how you learn, like meaning you'll put yourself in situations where that, that doesn't seem very good. The second step is to actually proactively be like, that sucked, now what? Like, let's okay. just not do that one again. <laughs> 
Um, if you guys decided to defend top tower or like play around top and it would have worked, but one of your guys just fat fingered a button or some shit, it's really important to try to recognize why it didn't work. Meaning if one of your guys is royally fucked up, then don't let that affect the fact that you should have made that play. Do you know what I'm saying? But if you guys just go top yeah. and it just feels really shitty, you know what I mean, right? When I say, like, you just go into a situation and you're like, that didn't feel good. It's like, oh, yeah, cause, go ahead. Like, some of the games where you feel like you have nothing to do and then you just go somewhere and it feels bad, it's kind of hard to, sometimes it's hard to recognize when it's when you should, like, leave. That's kind of what I'm... I think that's the thing I'm worse at. Okay. I want to, obviously, help them farm, but, like, at the same time... Obviously, that example, I shouldn't have been there. And I... Obviously... I think I knew that, but I was just there anyway. So I don't know... So the cool thing really about the early game, if you try to trim up this decision-making, is oftentimes the game at that stage is slow-paced enough that if you mess up, you can afford one death or like one or two minutes of inefficiency to get to the right place, okay? If you make that mistake at like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the only way to actually learn is to watch the replay and watch like the two minutes that led up to that. Because at that stage in the game, if you make those types of plays, the game's just fucked. And the way you learn from those types of plays is realizing it was shitty, being like, why was it shitty? And then watching the two minutes that led up to it. Like, how did I allow this shitty thing to happen? Yeah. So, like, in this stage in the game, you have enough time to fix it. In that stage in the game, generally speaking, if you've lost map control at, like, 25, 30 minutes, the only thing you can do is smoke and, like, try to fight them or some shit. Like, there's no complicated... It's not complicated at that point. It's it, Meaning it's so complicated, there's literally nothing you can do other than just, like, fighting them. <laughs> like... There's just nothing else you can do. So go ahead and bring, give me another replay and we'll uh, watch another one. But if you yeah, really practice this thing five or ten minutes in, it'll really help you for the entire game. But go ahead. Sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. No, I just thought I'm just giving you. Like, I didn't want to like give you a replay that I thought was like a good replay. Of course. Of course. Yeah. It's better to just like give you a random one. I can just sort of oh. see what's up. Yeah, I mean, that that's, I'm not, I don't go into these lessons being like, this guy should have played perfectly, why didn't he give me a, you know, why? <laughs> that's not the point here. So, like, a lot of times, you know, viewers are pretty harsh and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I'm just being harsh because I'm trying to give you all the, I'm not, like, assuming you do this every game. I'm assuming that way Dota works is we all have holes in our knowledge, we all have weaknesses in our game, and any time that the situation arises that that weakness is punishable say my map awareness is weak that's not going to get punished very hard if i'm a jug against no spin canceling tps right like yeah or, you can just but like yeah because i can just spin tp out worst case scenario but if i'm playing like drow against like three gankers and i have poor map awareness or like understanding of how to play the map i'm gonna feed like 20 times right so it's just one of those things where when you show me a bad game, you're showing me a weakness of yours because in that specific game, I see something that you didn't do properly where like certain games, it's correct to just sit behind your safe laner and protect them. And so in games where that's the case, you're probably going to do it correctly based on what I've seen so far. But if that's not the case, you're not doing it. So stop AFKing when you queue up. Jesus. Yeah, it's actually really bad because my chair is like completely broken and it keeps it keeps breaking, so I spend time, like, fixing it. Okay, okay. So, so uh, I understand that I not... Only... Bad, like... I got you. I got you. It sucks, but whatever it takes in your real-life situation to make it so you're not AFKing for the first minute, you just gotta do it. You know, like, it's actually going to make your early game so fucking weird, like, to have that be the case. So, just something to consider. Here, I probably would have gone three tangos, no sentry and a win lace. Why would I go win lace this game? Um, I need to actually look at the hero. I can't really see. Probably just because of Pudge and the fact that if he gets on top of me, I die. Yeah, and I, I feel like in this game, if you're slow, like 277, 
you're actually just dead to like half their lineup like meaning like they can just walk at you and hit you mainly yep. with the pudge like it would be better to have less regen and have a win lace than it would be to have more regen and a win lace what or than and not a win lace in games where movement speed doesn't prevent you from taking damage where they have like a ranged hero or just like ranged harass it's not that great to have a win lace in that situation because most of the damage is from range anyway so like you yeah. actually need so you're sustain. not gonna avoid more by yeah like exactly this. so in this game you're actually just saving gold and also like giving your like you can just buy one tango like you can actually get away with one tango this game because like if you're playing against like pudge naga or like pudge morphling or some shit you're not going to take any damage if you're running away from them faster right so it's just something to consider like uh being able to skimp out on regen as a support even as a core if i know there's something that makes it so that i will take less damage <laughs> by having it that effectively gives me regen so just something to consider generally when it comes to dewarding the pull camp i've learned from watching other players that it's worth missing the first pull at one minute to have them prove that there's a ward there okay so like yeah don't i i just from watching other players i briefly took time because i realized i probably wasn't supporting properly i took the time to watch them and i never once i was doing this too i never once saw them preemptively place a sentry on the pull camp because as a support that 100 gold is so precious to you right yeah. and usually what happens is if they have a ward top over the course of the first minute or two it kind of becomes apparent where it is if you actually realize it right like whether yeah, they're the running at you every time you walk through a certain place the poles blocked you know sorry what were you gonna say though it's just that I think the past, like recently, a lot more people had started like blocking the camp with sentries, and I was just like frustrated. So I just buy the sentry, like I think every game now and place it. But I've recently gotten better at realizing that they have not actually placed, like gone to place okay. it. If you know what I mean? Cause Funny little like, quiz staring. question: Why do you know? Why do you not know that they have a sentry or ward there? Because you like you can like stand around and stay in the area until. They're, no, because you, know you spent the there. first fucking minute in the fountain. <laughs> 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 Meaning, like, it's yeah, actually, true. you have you no fucking way to know whether or not they wore yeah, it because you fucking sent Some them. Other. You, yeah, so my point is that's why the first minute is, like, so important. Because if the other guy spends the first minute walking out and warding and you spend the first minute AFK, you literally have zero idea. Like, if you spend the first minute walking to here, you can deduce that they didn't have a ward there, right? Yeah. Like. That's the point, right? So, like, uh, it's just funny. Like, it's a little thing about, like, how that important that is. Because it just gives you... A lot of Dota is just process of elimination. Like, I told you when to carry jungles, it's because they've deemed nothing else worth it. Like, when you're warding and dewarding, it's like, well, they don't have any wards here. So, most likely, all of their control is here because it's not there. And it's like, I know they're top because I don't see any of them bottom. Like, that's a lot of map awareness and warding and stuff. So, let's see. So, you guys have a safe lane Mars. This is quite interesting. You get a kill, the lane's pushed out a little bit. You see that it's pushed. Go immediately pull. Okay, this is good. So far. A lot of try lanes in this bracket, but that's okay. Miss the pull a little bit. I think it's because of the slow from the creep. I didn't anticipate it. Those creeps don't slow. They don't? No, they just supply oh, like a poison dot. <laughs> Low. Yeah, I'm just, you know, calling you on your bullshit. So, lane's gonna push into your tower. When you have a bunch of creeps, there's really nothing for you to do here. Okay, so, based on your own creep wave, what dictates the likelihood the opponent's going to contest you at your pull? If it's, sorry, say that again. If you look at your own equilibrium here, what about the equilibrium tells you the likelihood of the opponent contesting you at your own pull. So if the pills like I'm saying if, if you're thinking about them contesting your single pull or your small camp pull, if the lane's here, how is that any different than if the lane's here? Cause like they can stop you easier if the lane's like closer to the tower. Okay. So in what situation will I realistically be able to pull through? If they're like, if the wave's like under their tower. Yeah, right? Because they can't stop you. But if the lane's here, how often ever against decent players am I going to be able to pull through? 
Yeah, like uh, n basically never. Literally never, right? So when it comes to like people asking BSJ, when do I pull through and stuff? I literally say, are they going to contest you? Like, can you pull through? <laughs> right? Like, cause it's obviously and better to pull through in the sense that you're getting more yeah. denies on your own creeps and you're getting more jungle camps. But if you're like handing them a creep wave underneath a jungle camp, right? Like, and they can just That's walk just over and stop you. You'd have rather have the lane meet here than having them randomly pull the creeps that were in your pull to here. Right? Like, so, so I should strictly never pull through unless the lane's like under their tower it, it, and this lane specifically. Okay. So just to give you a better answer of that, that is the rule. Okay. But the true best answer is based on the exact situation they're in. If they can't contest you at the big camp, you can pull through. Yeah. So most of the time that is based on the fact that the lane's out here. Okay, but there are situations where your carry is like a really scary hero and they can't do anything to that guy. And if he's sitting right here and they walk over, they're just going to die. Okay, like yeah. that is a case, right? So it's just something where I like to prefer to ask myself whether or not they can contest me and then base it off of where the lane is. So like a lot of these things I'm telling you when you're considering pulling the big camp, you'll immediately check the wave. Like, you'll immediately check it, and you'll immediately be like, okay, how does this wave affect, like, where my two heroes are? Meaning, like, meaning like uh, you know, who becomes stronger and why, and all that kind of stuff. So if you start asking yourself these kind of questions, sometimes you'll pull through thinking you can do it, and then their offlaner will just walk through the creep wave that they have right here, bring it with them, and hit you over <laughs> here, right? Like, and there's some times where the offlaner doesn't mind walking through six creeps. And there's times where if they do that, they're going to just fucking die, right? And, like, you can learn based on those types of little things, like, whether or not they can contest you. So the point that I see here is you're, like, considering pulling or you're considering, sorry, pulling through, or you're considering helping your Mars. Are you fighting them at all here? Why or why not? Uh, what do you mean here? Like, here. Like, in this situation, are you guys fighting them? Why or why not? No, because... Well, we have creeps, and it's pushing towards them, so I don't think we're fighting. Yeah, so they have five creeps, and you have zero. At this stage in the game, that's a pretty big deal, right? Because creeps do a lot of damage relative to heroes at this yeah, stage in the game. And then secondly, you have a clockwork who benefits from having no creeps around, and there are creeps, yep. so that makes no sense. And then you also have, if you don't fight here, what happens? The we. If we don't fight just now, yeah, then our Mars gets a... F He's just going to farm under tower, right? Far. He's just going to sit under tower, right? Generally speaking, in the safe lane, if I think to myself, if we don't fight, it's okay, then I don't fight them. <laughs> like, okay. like, like, meaning, like, if I'm happy with what's going on, if no fight's happening, then I'm just not going to fight. Um, the only time I generally, like, want to fight as a safe laner is when it's enabling me because if I don't fight, I'm kind of just, like, not getting farm or I'm not getting enough farm or whatever. So the point, though, is I look at this and you have a pull through. And based on this equilibrium, what's the odds that the opponent can test you? Like, 100%. It's pretty, like, meaning it's pretty high that the minute they see these creeps walking into your tower, they're going to come over. So what should you be doing? denying all this you should be denying and killing this as fast as possible yeah right like that's what you should be doing and then like that's that's how you come to these conclusions and so every time you look at every time you pull it you should just immediately check the status of the wave because if it's out here then you should try to eke this out as long as possible and then you like denying as many creeps as possible and then looking to pull through if the lane's doing this you should try to kill these things before the opponent contests you, right? Like, because then they're getting XP, maybe they're sniping some of your CS, maybe they're actually killing yeah. you, you know? Um, and so these are just things, a lot of things to think about when you're pulling. It seems so simple once you get, like, these thoughts down, but if you're not thinking about these things, you're doing this, where you're like, eh, eh. like, this just seems stupid. You're missing pull, your Mars is tanking creeps, like, you're, you're, you know, missing farm here. You didn't kill the camp. So the point of pulling, like, I'd say... At least half of the purpose of pulling. What would you say the two pri what separates the five the th case supporters? Guess like the three supports. primary purposes of pulling. In your mind, guess. The three uh, primary purposes. Probably experience for okay. the support and then the equilibrium little and uh I don't know what the third And the experience is. for your carry. Those are the three. 
you're getting experience, so that's why you're over there. You're not taking experience from your carry. That's the second. Yeah. And then the equilibrium. That's third. So those are like the three primary purposes. So it's like, in this case, it like based on everything we see here, it just made no sense to fight them. Just go pull, right? Like just yeah. be sitting at the pull because the equilibrium was bad in the sense that like, in the early game, almost every fight is dictated by how many creeps there are. But it's like, if you have an axe, he probably wants more enemy creeps around him when he's fighting. Um, and that's something to consider. Like, I've talked about that in other coaching sessions. But now, guess what? Why did your Mars die there? I, I couldn't see. Because he'd been tanking, like, seven creeps for the last minute <laughs> and a half while all this random shit's been going on. Like, he's actually been tanking, like, seven creeps. And so... He probably lost like 300 health from creeps over the course of the last minute and a half. So it's like more so probably your clockwork, but it's you getting baited by your clockwork is how I would deem it. Um, so the goal is to have enough confidence in our own decisions to not get baited by what others are doing that deviates from our own decisions. So when you stack the big camp or the small camp like that, I would definitely be like maybe using a nuke or two to try to kill it. Um, I would only be denied, like, your goal is to balance your own creeps dying and the opponent in the jungle creeps dying. You're kind of putting a lot more emphasis on getting your own creeps killed rather than killing both. So just something to consider. Like, be more adamant about actually killing the pull camp. That's why you're doing it, right? Like, to give yourself a little bit of XP. Yeah. So yeah, you're just like level two and three quarters right now instead of probably level three, three and a half. So I don't mind that kill, because you have a Kunkka against Invoker. Why don't I mind going for that play when you have Kunkka against Invoker? What's the dynamic of Kunkka versus Invoker? Who's favored? The Kunkka? Why? Sorry, and favored in what way? In the lane, sorry. Like, who wins the lane? I think Kunkka wins the lane. When they had Tidebringer, like, not nerfed on Denies... When it Kunk was the Denying thing. Kunkka was like 90-10 in this lane, okay? Like, okay. Kunkka shit yeah. on this lane. He's still like 70-30, like 60-40 at least, okay? Like, he's still really good against Invoker. Invoker has really low armor, and Kunkka just has like... So Invoker's choice is to go Quas Exhort, or sorry, Quas Wex, and have no damage, so the Kunkka gets all the denies. Or to go Quas Exhort and not have enough sustain because he needs Exhort to get lasted. So either way, he loses the matchup, okay? So... Okay. If a hero loses the matchup, what does that mean the lane's going to look like at five minutes, four minutes into the game? The lane? In terms in... of equilibrium. Sorry. They're probably... Just, well, the t no, no one's going to push the tower. What way, hero so pushes into who? Gonna... The one that's stronger or the one that's weaker? Stronger. Okay, so I like the fact that you wrapped around mid tower. Why? Because he's going to be behind his tower. Because he's going to be shoved behind his tower. Isn't it really easy to know he's somewhere around there? Right? Like, yeah. he, has to, he has to be. If you put a ward here and you know this lane's pushed in, you know the invoker is here. Like, you don't know exactly where, but you know he's there. Right? Like, where else is he? <laughs> right? So I like this rotation because you have a winning matchup and you know the lane's going to be pushed. And it's the catapult timing. It might have already died. I think it's probably still alive. Yeah, it's still alive. So it's the catapult timing. You know the lane's pushed in. So it's very predictable where this guy's going to be. He's going to be He's gonna be right here. So it's like you just walk in and find him. That's a very high probability play. The other one where you were a viper against invoker and you ganked for the invoker was just really straight. Like the guy just died with no reactions, right? Like, yeah. like <laughs> but you had really no way of knowing if viper was here or here or like, you know, whatever. And it barely worked with them not helping at all. So it's just one of those things where I like this rotation because you're making us play around a guy that, like, wants you to make plays around him. So I want you to be able to know why that's good, you know, eventually. Um, okay, so... I don't love this ward. Why? Why would this um, ward generally be good? Glorious. What? I can't see where it is. Uh, on the mini map, the one in their ancients. Why can't you see my cursor? I can't see it. I can't. It just doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. You can't yeah. see. It's like it's not close. You can't see it close. Okay, you have one at their enemy ancients. You have one here. Um, it doesn't really do anything. I I, honestly, it doesn't do anything. Like, what kind of game would this ward do something? If they had like a. I don't know, like an offlane axe or something. You want offlane to axe, offlane enigma, maybe a dark seer. Yeah. 
right? But they don't have any of that shit. And who's their primary jungle farmer? The guy mid, right? Yeah. So it's like, I would have had this ward be where this guy's going to be farming, which is around here, right? And so most of the time, he's going to be farming around here. And if you have a ward here and you don't see him, where is he? Mets. He's either here or he's here. So I'd say yep. you're doing the same thing by eliminating the fact that he's not farming here. And so you know he's here. We know he's not farming there. That's... <laughs> but the point is, most of the time he's going to be farming this area. So if this is yeah, the better area for him to be farming, you'd rather make sure he's not here first, right? And then yes. it, then force him to here. So like that's just something to think about, is like who's their jungle farmer and where they're going to be farming that jungle. Like where do they want to go? And then if you know where they want to go, all you got to do is prevent them from going there. <laughs> like, you know, so because anything else is bad for them, right? If you think about what objective yeah. they want to take, if you prevent them from taking that objective... Anything else is bad, right? So that's all you have to think about. You just have to prepare for whatever the team, enemy team wants. So, like, if anything else happens, it's okay because that's not what they want. So, um, all that's that's how you like isolate your thinking so you don't try to consider stopping like all objectives or everything in the game. So nice. Notice how plays are really easy when your core is way stronger than theirs. And even though it didn't exactly go right, you still had a good situation like meaning it still hasn't gone bad <laughs> like this just shows how weak invoker is against kunkka this is definitely some questionable shit going on here <laughs> this has probably gone on like you know 10 seconds a little but that was like worst case scenario and you brought three heroes there and you know you died so whatever like that like that's the kind of example where worst case scenario is that rather than last game where you're making plays in the wrong place and you know you fed three heroes <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. So. I don't mind you going top because you have a Mars. Sentry. I feel like that Sentry. Eh, I guess they could have warded there. Despite your ward. Gotta get better at tower aggroing. You know how tower aggro works? Yeah, I, I do. I just See, like exactly. That I'm just making sure. Me. Like, can you tell me if I were to ask you, could you tell me exactly how it works? I can. I probably can describe it, but. I... Okay. Uh, at the end I of can... the day, I've realized that's a really important thing for all roles. Basically, tower has 700 range. If you walk within 500 range of it, and you're like, and there's creeps, and you walk within 500 range of the tower, and you a click a hero, you're gonna draw tower aggro. So, like, notice yeah. how this is 700 range. If you're anywhere around here. And you de-aggro. If, if I'm within 500 range, and my closest creep is 600 range away, can I de-aggro the tower? No. Okay. That's good enough for me. I make sure this, because you'd be amazed how many people think they know tower aggro, and they and they don't. So, uh, okay. In that spot, you just, like, A-click the guy, and then never de-aggroed. So you, like, did twice the mistake, because you just, you know, you first off drew the aggro, and then you didn't get rid of it. Yeah. That's why I, I felt the, you know, the need to bring it up. So, I feel like in this kind of game, your team is the one making plays. You had a strong offlaner. Like, even if Viper's not the most traditional offlaner. You had a strong mid lane matchup. So, that makes you guys proactive, right? Because you had good matchups. Generally speaking, that's how it goes. The team with better yeah. matchups will be the one doing more. So, where should most of your wards be? Uh, down bottom. Down bottom, right? So the reason why proactive plays are usually made here is because it's just harder to take over this part of the map than it is here. Just because the enemy can defend this area with like one or two wards and there's like very constricted areas to get into here, okay? So it's just easier to take this area of the map over, right? They made it a little bit difficult last patch when they put these ramps and made this like a high ground and stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, like... The only reason people choose this usually is because they're strong enough to take this over, but they're not strong enough to take this over. So the times where teams will take this over is when? The times when we take top over? Or yeah, rather that you choose to take top over rather than bottom. Maybe if we have like really strong tower push. If you're or... just super strong, like yeah. way stronger than them. Meaning like if you walk up a hill blind, you don't care what you find. You're just going to walk up the hill blind, yeah. right? Like, 
that's the that's the type of strength that usually is required to take that area of the map over okay so like the point is usually people choose this part just because it's easier so like if you're ahead you'll choose this area first notice they actually have wards in pretty good places so what happens generally speaking is people will take this part of the map over and then once they've taken this over they'll then try to take this over because like if you take this over where's the enemy team going to be yeah just here they're going to be up here <laughs> so it's like we prove that they're not here and then we go here because that's where we know they are and so like if this is one of those where you're strong enough to control the map. This is one of those where you're strong enough to fight them. Like, don't give a shit how many they bring. If we have four heroes yeah. there, they're yes. dying, right? That's, like, usually when teams will take this spot over. Because by... You usually have to use brute force to get this area taken over. This area, you can kind of just be like... If they have three heroes here, they're just wasting their time. Right? Because the idea is, if they want objectives, they're usually up here. So if you want to take this away from them, they you usually have to fight through like three or four guys to like take it away from them. But like if they're putting three or four heroes here, they're just like wasting their time. Like what the fuck are they doing? So like, because, and you may say BSA, why? Why are they wasting their time? Well, if they have three or four heroes here, what objectives are they doing? What objectives are they threatening? None. None. So we don't care if they have three or four heroes there. If I walk uphill as a Crystal Maiden at this stage in the game, and my Mars is pushing bottom lane, and I walk up this hill into four heroes and die, am I upset? Not really, no. No, you just told the Mars that they have four heroes doing nothing on the map. Be careful. <laughs> like, right? Like, But if yeah. I walk up here and die, a lot of times what will happen is they'll kill you and like turn that into a tower push for free okay. because you died as a support, right? But uh, down here, if you die, deaths are only bad if the opponent gets something off of them. So dying on your own side of the map where they can take objectives is way more costly than dying here. So like, if you know it's going to take three heroes to kill you and you're just playing around here, it's not a really a big deal if they kill you. Because if, they, if you're like feeding solo kills to a carry, that's like very, you know, very different. Like, because that's where one guy wants to be. Um, but the point is, though, I just don't see any wards on the bottom half of the map. We now have one here. Yeah. Looks like we have one here. Oh, wait, no. Is that an enemy ward? Fog the Dire. Yeah, that's an enemy ward. That's a really weird visual bug. But yeah, we just, once again, last game, we talked about that you want to make um, defensive play, or you want your you want to help your Alk be defensive, so the play the ward should be top defending him. This game, you want to make proactive plays, and you have no wards on the proactive side of the map, so it's just something to rehash. It's a little bit different where they should be this game, yeah. but uh, same idea. Uh, okay... Once you lose war control of the map, it just feels really awkward to get it back. Top tower is under attack. So we're still sitting on the no boots train. I don't really... Okay. I would have walked here, I think. Because... So we're going to rewind to why you should walk here. So why, what factors could you think of that would make it so walking to bottom would be better? If there's somewhere, if there's like a fight in the last TP. Yeah, or... so by TPing, it makes it so you're not going to be anywhere else. So when should you TP to a lane as any hero in the game? If you know there's not going to be a fight. Yes, or if, if you, if you know you're not going to go to a fight... Or you know that you want to be there regardless of what happens in the game. And so I'm looking at this saying, I don't want to be here if something happens mid. So I want to be able to go mid. And walking is just slower, so that's something to consider. But like, look at the lane. It's all the way down here. Right? If the lane's like at your tower already, sure, TP. But like, okay. you know, the lane's all the way back here. So a lot can happen in the 10 seconds between this lane getting to here where maybe you end up TPing anyway. But don't make that decision before you have to. You know what I'm saying? So by TPing yeah. somewhere, you're actually in a lot more danger as well. And that's why it's so important that you know you want to be there. Because if you know you want to be there, generally that's because you know it's not a dangerous area or you know nothing can endanger you there. So like if you see a Morphling down there and you TP there, what ends up happening is very likely to happen because you just put yourself against a guy that could kill you and then you have no way out, right? You could have maybe just like TP'd safely 
or whatever hat. Like you could have just played it differently. You'll learn that if you think about how much TPs offer you offer you in terms of safety, you'll stop TPing as much. Um because TPs make make things so much easier um in terms of safety because it allows you to like run a bunch of different directions and then just TP out. If you don't have a TP, you usually have to run a very specific direction to live. So we're fast forwarding here. Um, still no boots feels bad, man. Uh... uh, I'm actually really sorry, but I have to go. Oh, that's a first. Unfortunately. All good. I mean, we were going for about an hour and a half, so that's fine. Um, that's a first. Yeah, I've got to go to work. Yeah, no problem, Sorry. dude. Uh, thanks for signing up, dude. Uh, any last questions before you go? This is a first. Sorry. I was going to be done in like five or ten minutes so. anyways. I'll just, but... I'll just need to watch over the replay again, and I'll just watch it again. Awesome, dude. That'll be really good. Uh, yeah. Thanks for signing uh, up. But yeah, we had talked about it a lot. I'm not going to rehash it for you because you can just watch it back and make sure you get to work on time and all that shit, so... Have a great night, man. Have fun at work. Okay, or thank you very day. much. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, see you. I think he just hated the session, guys.